I was born on February 8, 1898, in Medina, Italy, to Alfredo and Adelgisa Ferrari. The early 20th century was a time when cars were not a common means of transportation as they are today. Italy at that time had just a few local car workshops run by engineers. My father was one of them, a structural metal contractor with his own business who also helped repair cars since he had a good understanding of how cars worked, owning one himself. And my mother was a typical Italian homemaker who adored both my elder brother Dino and me. When I was about 10 years old, my father Alfredo took both my brother and me to our first ever automobile race in Bologna. The very event where I discovered an all new world of automobiles in speed. And that was it. I was bitten with the racing bug. I witnessed Jean Alessi the Great in 1900 and Vincenzo Lancia driving at fierce speeds all leaving me in a trance. This was the epitome of bravura for me. It was a turning point in my young life, the one that put me on the path to the world of automobiles. Ever since, I would often help my father out at the workshop, and in return, he would teach me how to drive. Unfortunately, by the time I was old enough to pursue my dream, the First World War broke out in 1914. This was a tough time for our family. My father and elder brother were both drafted into the Italian army to fight in the war. Later in 1916, the outbreak of influenza led to the tragic death of both of them, and we had to shut our workshop in Italy. This was the lowest point for my family. We were completely shaken and confused with the events that unfolded. In 1917, I left school and got recruited as a military blacksmith to earn a livelihood. But due to my poor health, I was let go with barely a year of service. I was extremely stressed, desperately looking for ways to earn and support what was left of my family and myself. Not long after, I decided to race test cars for a small automobile company in Milan called Costruzioni Meccanice Nazionali. This allowed me to work with former race car drivers and engineers. Not long after, I was given the chance to compete with the company's racing team. I made my public debut at the 1919 Parma Poggio di Borsetto Hill Climb Race, where I finished in fourth place. One thing led to another, and by 1920, I became a race car driver for the Alfa Romeo company with the help of the friends I made in Milan. I was finally getting to live my dream, but there's a lot more to this story. After winning the Circuito del Savio in 1923, I met the parents of the late World War I ace fighter pilot, Francesco Baracca. I reminded them so much of their own son that they even invited me over for a meal. As we sat down, they recounted countless stories of their lost son. I was completely touched. I spent the rest of the day with them to listen to them. One of the stories included Francesco's emblem he had put on his plane. He believed that it brought him good luck, and I was lucky enough to be gifted it from his parents to carry on his memory in some way. This emblem was of a black prancing horse called Cavallino Rampante. After this, I went on to win several races that year and was honored by my country for my sporting achievements. It was in the same year in 1923 that I got married to Laura Dominica Guerrello. In 1929, I decided to build my own team called Scuderia Ferrari, a name inspired by a stable reserved for racing horses. We served the Alfa Romeo racing team for about 10 years. I made Francesco's emblem the focus of our team's logo, putting it on a yellow background to represent the city of Medina. I handpicked and scouted the best talent to form my team, including Tazio Nuvolari and Giuseppe Campari. Our team went on to win multiple iconic races like the Grand Prix, quickly earning a name for ourselves in the market. This was at the time when sports car racing was really taking off as an activity for the rich and famous. In 1931, I placed second at the Circuito Tre Province, the last time I ever drove a race. You see, I had made a decision that year. After spending years to achieve the life I always dreamed of, I wanted to dedicate some time to my family. In 1932, Laura and I had a son, Alfredo Dino. 
He was our pride and my successor. Although not a racer anymore, I continued working with my team Scuderia Ferrari up until Alfa Romeo decided to disband the team and build another one in 1938. They appointed me as the head, which I accepted, but only for a short while. I resigned from the company in 1939. I decided to start my own company, named Auto Avio Costruzioni, but this too wasn't without a penalty. I got a hefty severance from the man himself, Alfa Romeo. Apparently, I couldn't associate the name Ferrari with any of my cars or races for at least four years. Can you believe that? I used this time to develop tools and aircraft parts for the Mussolini government. The company name wasn't changed to Auto Costruzioni Ferrari until 1957, and the first car to bear my name was the Ferrari 125S, followed by the Ferrari 166. From this point onward, my company released several sought-after models year after year, including the Testarossa, the car that won three world championship titles. My company was reaching staggering heights at both sides, production and racing. Things were looking good until we hit the 1960s when I offered my wife Laura a position as manager of the company. Despite all the protests from several senior employees, she took the job. Laura's attitude didn't sit right with our employees and at one point, nine of them collectively approached me, demanding her resignation. Infuriated, I did the only thing I could think of. I fired each of those nine employees. Most of them were very senior in the company, ones that were really valuable company employees. This was an event never to be forgotten in Ferrari history. It even got its own name, the Great Walkout. To add on to this disaster, some of our best drivers died over the next two years. Overwhelmed, I had to stop all production work for about a year before I decided to start everything up again. I even hired younger engineers and made a comeback stronger than ever with the Ferrari 250 GTO. We didn't stop there. Towards the end of the 1960s, we had released several masterpieces, including the Ferrari 275 and the Ferrari Daytona. As the years passed by, I started to see an increase in demand for my cars, but the company couldn't keep up. So I decided to sell 50% of my company to Fiat. Not only did this help us match the demand, but gave me the idea of producing more affordable cars to reach a wider audience. This idea of mine gave birth to Dino, a small venture car. I did this in honor of my son, who we lost a couple of years ago in 1956. He was only 25, but Dino had a rare disease named muscular dystrophy, and there was nothing we could do. The years that followed took Ferrari to new heights. During the 70s, we won three drivers' championships. We had iconic racers such as Niki Loda and Jody Schechter under our roster. In 1984, we brought back a redesigned version of the Testa Rossa, which was made popular by the TV show Miami Vice. In 1987, the F40 was released and would be the last model created under my name. The following year, I passed away at the age of 90. But my company lives on. My name is Enzo, and I am the founder of Ferrari. If you guys like that video, please hit the like button. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. Just the research and the editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. Um, we produce over like 12 videos per month, so that's literally 8 cents per video. Thanks so much guys. Peace out.